the green button. Good afternoon. Tough fact to follow. Not only am I following lunch, I'm following the awards as well and following Sue's thing of revalidation. So thanks very much for um, MMF for asking me to speak. Um, thank you very much for coming to hear me talk. And thank you very much to anybody who may be listening online. So, as Sue says, I've been consultant midwife for NHS Ayrshire and Arden uh, since 2007. And when she gave me the remit, the career pathway for a consultant midwife, I thought, what, what slant do I use for this? Because I could come up and I could talk about how it came to be, all the things that were put into place for it, any papers that were written on it, and, or I could do, here's Geraldine's story, and I thought, that's a bit egotistical, and mm, they might not want to hear that either. So I've done a wee bit of both. And then how I finished is adding in things that if you are an aspiring consultant midwife, you maybe should be thinking about to try and get there because I don't think any of my consultant midwife colleagues are here in the room, but we're all a certain age. <laughs> so we want to make sure that there are people who are coming up who are going to take over our roles and we need to be really seriously thinking about succession planning. So all I can say about is my journey and my experience and how um, the things in my journey that I think made me appointable as a consultant midwife, and you, you may or may not agree, but, but that'll be my story. So if you go back, so the, the bit that was in the literature, 1999, this was clinical career progression because to get on, you had to be a manager. The only way that you could get promotion within the NHS was to go down the managerial route. And anybody that would know me, I'm looking at Noreen here, will know I'm not manager material. But my heart and soul lay in clinical care and what's best for women, children, families in NHS Ayrshire So this post came into being to keep the clinical expertise at the bedside instead of good clinicians progressing up the ladder no harm to, to managers, but very few of them can actually do direct clinical care as, as they go up the ladder. It was specifically mentioned that they were not to be managers. It was supposed to sit alongside higher managers, but not to be managers. It was to be something completely different. Not to be tied up in their strengths and weaknesses in that in terms of budget. So more an ideas person, more with a heart at clinical care, out there understanding on a day-to-day -day basis what it meant for the staff uh, working in the various clinical areas and not to have day-to-day -day organisational responsibilities within departments, not to be tied down with HR, sickness, absence, all of those type of things. But had to work with managers. Clearly we can't do anything on our own. We have to work with managers and take them along with us and to be equal team members, particularly with the head of midwifery, um, so that we would see that we would be the clinical lead and they would be the managerial lead within the organisation. And we have our ear to the ground and what's going on to a day-to-day -day basis um, in our clinical areas so that we can lead and innovate and not be burdened down by a lot of the managerial tasks. And working with the head of midwifery to have that shared vision for service development. And alongside that, because clinical was supposed to be 50% of a consultant midwife remit, it um, had to have a strong clinical field and therefore people elected to have special areas of interest and expertise. So if you had to do a Google search and look for consultant midwife job descriptions, you will find a few uh, different areas in there. Commonly would be normality or public health, but there are uh, consultant midwives for vulnerabilities and, and various other things too. So the key areas of the role, as I said, supposed to be for 50% of your time spent in clinical practice. To do professional leadership and consultancy, so that's working at a local level, but also working at a strategic level. So being involved in national groups and taking midwifery and maternity care forward and giving your opinion on things that affect those. Practice and service development, both locally and nationally, and research and evaluation. Education and training quite often comes into the role as well. 
So obviously Anne was with us earlier in the day. Anne was our first consultant midwife for Greater Glasgow and Clyde and started work in 2000. So she was the first in Scotland. And then she was joined in Lothian by Sandra Smith, who then went on to have an S secondment, and Fiona Gregg, who's still a consultant midwife for Tayside. But Scotland seemed to be a bit slow in growing consultant midwives. We didn't really grasp it and run with it the way that England had. So the Scottish Government, who appointed at that time all of the consultant midwives had to be approved by the Scottish Government, um, set up the Keeping Childbirth Natural and Dynamic Programme, KCND or KIND, as it was called. And part of that was to put people in behind the programme to help with its implementation. And there was a consultant midwife to be appointed in every board or shared within the smaller boards. So this was actually my first experience of government putting its money where its mouth is in terms of driving policy. So that was a big thing in Scotland. So where are we now? Fiona's still there in Tayside. I'm still there in Ayrshire and Maureen, who is a award winner in midwifery um, in Lanarkshire. Rona McInnes in Lothian. Rona is very well published, particularly in the field of breastfeeding researcher. And she's also associate professor with Napier University, so she's got that ac academic slant. And Karen King, uh, who has fairly recently become also head of midwifery. And Jackie Lambert, who you would have met earlier on, I'm sure, uh, who is for NHS Highland and also has recently become head of midwifery. So that's me, 21. Not, not the best of photos in terms of it's a bit grainy, but so much has happened since then, obviously. So I started my student nurse training, as you had to do in those days in Scotland, and was in Verclyde, basically in Greenock. And I thought I wanted to work in ICU or coronary care until I did my maternity experience, and then I thought, this is it. The reason I thought this is it was they had no midwives, any body, any one body was a useful body. We were left looking after people as nursing students up into the second stage of labour, and you thought they were the bee's knees because ignorance is bliss. And we have came so far from there, thankfully, but it did set that passion alight for midwifery and maternity care. I did do a, bre a brief stint between my babies um, as a surgical nurse, and then a chance conversation after I had my second child, while I was still on the delivery bed, my husband said, any jobs going? She's looking for a job because I'd moved from Greenock back down to Ayrshire. And they were that short of midwives at the time, they actually employed staff nurses. So that was how I came into maternity care via the back door, working as a part-time staff nurse, mainly doing postnatal care until the wee ones were big enough that I could go and do my midwifery. Staff midwife, November 1987. And then I did the usual rotation that you do. And in 1996, I actually put in for two ward manager posts, which were interviewed for simultaneously. And the then head of midwifery says, you're not manager. <laughs> um, you would be better in practice development. I don't think that you would be suited to some of the things, that the managerial aspects of it. I think you'd be more wanting to do clinical and, and innovation. So she obviously seen in me things that I wasn't so sure about at the time still being quite young. NHS Education Scotland did a succession planning course for NMAP nursing midwifery allied health professional consultants. And that was a year long thing that you were signed up. You had some mentorship. You had a few days to attend. There was a small budget went with it so that you could go out and gain some of the attributes that you would need in a CV if you were applying to be a consultant midwife. And I was very fortunate along the way, one of those things, the opportunity that just comes up and you grab it, and working with NHS Quality Improvement Scotland and worked on the midwifery formula and midwife prescribe in 2006 to 2007, which put me nicely in when KCND started to be able to apply for the consultant midwife post. And at that time, the KCND money was sometimes used for secondment, and sometimes used to actually fund a substantive post. So I was very lucky that my head of midwifery had the insight to, to create that as a substantive post. So my academic journey, 
Because I do think you need a bit of the academic. If you're going to be discussing um, what the evidence is with midwives, with obstetricians, with anaesthetists, with academics, then you need to be understanding how you can analyse uh, research studies and so on. So I do think that it's important and obviously that's reflected in uh, the job descriptions. So pre-nursing degrees, I did an open university biology and general science degree and then done my master in midwifery 2001 and completed my PhD looking at lifestyle and pregnancy and uh, mental and physical well-being uh, in 2017, round about this time, graduated last year. So I had worked in community for 14 years, full and part-time, uh, worked part-time when I was practice development midwife, so I'd always done clinical. Um, my caseload got too big, so just before I became consultant midwife, I'd come in to work in uh, our midwifery suite. Uh, so again, that was well placed to help with KCND implementation. But in recognition of once we had done quite a bit in the normality field, there are other ways that you can try and keep women as normal as they possibly can in the wider context. So I started up first VBAC clinic, and it's like VBAC plus because at that point there wasn't many women came to you to discuss other things like birth choices. So I thought that we'll just slot them into that clinic. And rapidly, it got out of control, all the ad hoc appointments that I was having, that in January 2013, I started Fear of Birth, now called Birth Reflections Clinic, which looks at birth choices, uh, women who have had uh, negative birth experiences coming back for another baby, people who have negative birth experiences occasionally come back postnatal, some preconceptual, and almost half, sad to say, uh, ladies in their first pregnancy who have very significant fear of birth. So my key achievements, I'm trying to think, how do, you, how do you not go on too much about this? I was on NESC Compassionate Connection Steering Group. I have spoken at RCM Conference, ICM in Prague in Canada, MAMA Conference, had a couple of articles published. This is how you try and um, prove that consultancy, I suppose, to people outside your local area. I was very, very fortunate in 2014 when the Scottish Health Awards for Women and Children's and Mary Ross Davy and myself uh, won the Partnership Award for RCM in 2015 for the NES 1 out of 4 production, which is caring for survivors of sexual abuse in women's health. And obviously I implemented the wee pathways for maternity care, the green and orange document there. And you can't just do that, you have to say, move things on locally. So we'd used RCM Get Out of the Bed campaign to get women out of the bed, particularly in the midwifery suite, sad to see at the outset. With others, introduced hypnobirthing and aromatherapy and natal hypnotherapy to NHS Ayrshire Narn. 2009, along with one of our paediatricians, Sheena Kinman, our first guideline on delayed cord clamping. And this is a picture of Alexa who is the manager of our midwifery unit and current manager for community as well. And uh, Amy and Yaz, and Amy is one of my birth reflections ladies, who is a survivor, she doesn't mind, she's given me permission to tell her story. And although she was technically a high risk lady, we'd done a package of care to facilitate her having her baby in the midwifery unit after having a previous stillbirth. And this is Amy with Jo, just after the birth. And that's Joe will be well on. So Joe's quite big now, he's two, and Amy's thinking about coming around again. So it's that bit of thinking outside the box, being prepared to look at things from different angles to try and facilitate the care that women require. So Amy's care needs were, were psychological because she was a survivor, because she had a previous stillbirth. And for her, it meant that she really needed to be in the lowest tech environment with continuity of care that she could possibly get, rather than going through the other side and having continuous fetal monitoring, which many women would choose that would be the, the pathway that she wanted. And we actually did a process and induction of labor within the midwifery suite, which rocks a few boats because it's not core function of midwifery suite, but you go, we're actually here for the women. And as long as we safely get the plan of care and everybody knows why you're bending the rules, then as long as, as we're all very clear that that's what's going on with that particular lady, then in her case, it made the world a difference to her outcome. 
So what might you need to be a consultant midwife? So we said you have to keep emphasising the clinical, the clinical, the clinical. So that clinical and knowledge and skills, you need a wide knowledge, but obviously we can't have skills honed in absolutely every area of midwifery. So most people will specialise in one particular area, but you do need a broad knowledge and you do need a higher degree, preferably working towards a doctorate or having a doctorate. I laughingly put down good organisational skills because I'm fighting the clock all the time. It's just one of the things everybody does these days. I try and be as organised as I can. And you will find if you become a consultant midwife, the role is many faceted and you will have many projects on the go at the one time and you'll be keeping many plates up in the air. So you have to have a degree of organisation so that you can try and keep your sanity in that. But the good thing about the many plates up in the air is most of them you've actually spun yourself, you've got them going yourself, and there are things that you are interested in to help you keep them going. Good communication skills, because you're working with everybody, from porters, maternity care assistants, um, consultants, all our peers in, in midwifery, and subsector colleagues as well. So you really have to try and have good communication skills at all levels. Resilience. Persistence and patience. I'm sure Noreen would tell you I'm very persistent. Um, if I think something is needing done and it's going to benefit the women and families of Ayrshire, I'm like a broken record. And sometimes in all of those years that I have, 35 years in maternity care, I've learned that sometimes the time that you say it is not the time it's meant to happen. That you sometimes need to have the patience and the resilience to actually just wait and sometimes, if it's meant to be, it'll come round again. If it wasn't meant to be, don't worry about it. It's not going to happen. To think forward, which is harder, because as Mary Ross Davies said earlier on, we do tend to drag ourselves back to the past, but we need to try and think forward, and we need to try and see things from different angles. A wee thing that we change today can have ripples in so many directions, you just don't know until you start it. A bit like best start for those who were at the continuity workshop, is that the, the, even if the idea is a very good one, all of the practical things surrounding it need to be considered and they need to consider up, down and sideways as well. Don't be afraid to be doing that, I'm thinking. We need to challenge the box. The box keeps us enclosed, the box keep, keeps us in. We need to, for ourselves and for our women and families, to keep thinking, can we go outside the box? Why are we doing this? Should we still be doing it? Can we change what we're doing here? And passion, because that's what drives you. That keeps your energy going. When things are not going so well, that's what keeps you going. For me, my passion is my birth reflections clinic mainly, and it's the women that keep me going because you can't win them all, but when some of the women who have had been really scared of birth or have had really difficult births the first time, not necessarily obstetrically, sometimes it's communication, lack of support, those, those type of things. Um, when they come back and have had a positive birth experience the next time because we're trying to get a plan in place for them to support them, to communicate with midwives and what the women needs, then that's where I recharge my batteries from. So what could you do? Get that experience in the broader sense of midwifery. Really think about where your passion area is. You may know that already. Some people keep with the one area of passion and sometimes that passion might change through your career. If you haven't started already, now this is old hat because remember when I started doing my degree, there was no nursing degrees at that particular time. That's how old I am. Um, but now we've got students who are doing their masters so we, we obviously need to be shifting up a gear as well there. Consider project management, leadership courses if they're available. Make sure that you mention it in your PDR. Try and see what your organisation can do for you because there are loads of these courses locally that wouldn't cost you anything apart from possibly your time if you can't be released for the clinical area. So just think about that forward plan. What would, do you think you would need on that CV? Do a project that would benefit the service. Now we're all running hard to stand still, but sometimes that's the thing that gets your head above the parapet so that you actually say, this is something I'm really interested. Can I do a wee audit on this? Can I do a wee um, study on this? It's hard being at all poppy because they're likely to get their heads cut off, but do that wee bit different. 
get it noticed, and then if an opportunity arises, it means you're more likely to be in the right place at the right time. Hone your communication skills, especially those that are multidisciplinary. Look at the consultant midwife job descriptions for ideas. What else could you do? Be prepared to fight for what you think is needed. And you might not be very popular at times, but being popular is not the game. The game is about the best care for women and families. So if you think there's something worth fighting for, then go for that. Remember to choose your battles, and just because you've lost a battle doesn't mean that you won't ultimately win the war. As I've already said, know that now is not always the right time. And I was, when I became a practice development midwife, I thought, I'm going to change the world. All these things that we seem to take forever to get sorted, surely now we can get those sorted. Uh-uh. NHS, slow wheels, um, so many people that you have sometimes to, to be talking to that you don't even realise when you start a project. Just have that patience, have that resilience. You will get there in the end. You can't always turn things around quickly, but just keep at it. If something's not working, then is it the right thing to do? Is it the right time? Or do you need to find a different angle on it? Look at the bigger picture. What's the things that are stopping you um, changing something at this moment in time? You might find a way forward. So I hope that was helpful. Um, and I suppose it's over to you to see if you have anything you want to ask me about the consultant midwife role. Hiya. Hi there. Hi, um, I was just wondering, do you feel like the remit as a consultant midwife is still the one that you put up, that you had it, was it 2007, or do you feel like it's changed dramatically since has, then? Has my remit, sorry, old age, I'm getting a bit deaf, so has my remit changed? Yeah. So my remit has changed because instead of going a day into labour ward, into midwifery suite, and closing the door and working with the women, which hopefully benefited the women, but it wasn't actually getting seen, wasn't helping any midwives, wasn't really having much discussion with other midwives. Um, I eventually decided that that wasn't going to be a routine thing. I now go into, and I wish I'd have done it way back, I go into the midwifery suite every morning and say hello and have the report. And it's not about having the report and the expectation that I'm going to do lots and lots. Some days I might do, and other days I'm, you know, are you okay? And I'm, and I'm away again. But there's loads of things you find just in that quarter in our conversation of what's going on. And I just so wish I'd have done it earlier. The, the VBAC clinic was set up in 2008, so it was relatively quickly in. So it was in my original job description. But the birth reflections was the thing that is quite huge and evolved out of it. So most of my time is, at my clinical time is birth reflections and it is almost 50%. And when you include, I don't have admin support, so I'm setting up appointments, I'm doing referrals and doing all that kind of thing. Um, that easily is getting me my 50% clinical time. But it's not just seeing the women at the clinic. So we've developed a birth reflection service. So that ties in with natal hypnotherapy, hypnobirthing, uh, holistic clinics, so that's aromatherapy and other therapies, referral into peri perinatal mental health services. So a lot of that has shifted. So it's away from the intrapartum, direct hands-on, to more the how can we get pregnancy and labour and birth better for, for this woman this time. Thanks. And can I ask another question? There's not many consultant midwives in Scotland now in comparison to the number of health boards. Do you think that will change? I think we are in very difficult fiscal times, have been for a while. We actually were a lower number. We have fairly recently come back up to six. As you will see, two of the consultant midwives have had a midwifery in their title, which is really difficult because how you manage both jobs, both are huge, potentially huge jobs in their own right. You need to talk to Carmen and Jackie about that one. Um, I am now professional lead for community as well as midwifery suite, which I always have been the professional lead for. So it's just that time of people are asking you to do other things. There's always an expectation, whatever level you're at, that you're doing more in the, in the same time. 
but we are banging that drum, we are talking to people to try and get them to consider getting, I mean, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, biggest health board, doesn't have a consultant midwife, so, you know, we are trying to say there is, there is a great added value consultant midwife there, even though these are very hard times in terms of finance, your potential gains are much, so we keep on going with that, so fingers crossed, don't give up. Is that... Time. 